Back in the 80s and 90s, Japanese animation, anime, was a relatively niche market in the Western world. It was a time before online streaming or digital downloads. Cartoon Network's Toonami wouldn't launch until 1997. In these early days, only a handful of anime titles were released commercially, many with badly dubbed voiceovers. During this period, the internet was growing at a rapid pace and an entirely new subculture started to appear. Groups were formed that would import animated TV shows and movies from Japan, translate them into their native language, then overlay subtitles on the video using a home computer. These fan-made subtitled videos came to be known as fan subs. Their mission? Spread the word and raise awareness of this foreign entertainment medium by providing free access to the translated material. Hundreds of fan subbing groups appeared. They connected with each other over internet relay chat, exchanging knowledge, translated scripts, and their latest videotapes. They organized from within local college clubs and turned out in force at national conventions to showcase their latest releases on the big screen. If you knew the right people, you could gain access to vast libraries of fan sub content. Just like with software piracy, trading copies was commonplace, with each party publishing a list of what they had and what they wanted. And just like software piracy, fan subbing itself wasn't strictly legal, though the argument was made at the time that no commercial outlet yet existed for these titles, so no real harm was being done. Regardless, entire distribution networks sprung up to service an ever-increasing demand as the popularity of anime exploded in the West. Let me state up front that what I'm about to share with you are my own experiences as a fan subber in the 90s. Others will have certainly done things differently. I'll only be talking about the process of old school linear fan subbing to tape. Digital, nonlinear subtitling, known as digisubbing, came later with the advent of more powerful PCs and storage, and is beyond the scope of this video. The first thing we'll need is a video source. This could be a VHS recording from a televised broadcast that was mailed over from a contact in Japan. Sometimes, it'd be more like a seventh generation copy of a bootleg that was shot in a movie theater on a wobbly camcorder. And for all intents and purposes, DVDs didn't exist at all until the end of the linear subbing era. It goes without saying that starting with the highest quality source material will yield superior end results, and the best option at the time was Laserdisc. Most anime titles were available on the medium, although they could be quite costly and had to be imported from Japan. Nevertheless, they featured superior audio and video quality compared to other consumer options of the time, offering 425 lines of resolution versus the 240 of VHS. Further, LDs allowed for perfect synchronization to timelines of dialogue, and their output quality wouldn't degrade after many uses. Often, a VHS source was the only option available initially, but an updated release would follow when the LD became available. This is the actual Laserdisc player I used back in the 90s. It was probably one of the earliest donations to Retrobits, gifted by David Holdren a good 23 years before our first YouTube video ever came out. Quite prescient of Dave, if I do say so myself. Next, you'll need a computer with subtitling software and a GenLock. GenLock is short for Generator Lock, and describes the state of two or more video sources having their vertical, horizontal, and subcarrier signals synchronized with each other. When the raster lines are in sync and start at the same place in time, it allows for effects like transparencies, dissolves, and overlaying computer-generated text and graphics on top of another video source. All Amiga models are able to natively synchronize their system clock and video output with an external source. This small but important design choice is what allowed them to become inexpensive yet powerful video production workstations back in their day. If we look at the Amiga's AV connector, we see all the usual suspects, analog and digital RGB, sync, power, and ground. But on pin one, there's a special input called external clock. 
This allows another device to override the Amiga's internal clock, synchronizing the system to a multiplier of a video source's horizontal frequency. Further, the horizontal and vertical sync pins, which normally act as outputs, can be switched to inputs by enabling the Amiga's built-in GenLock bit via software. When these signals are fed into the Agnes chip from an external video, the Amiga can perfectly synchronize its video generation with that source. Because these features are built right into every system, many third parties built hardware to take advantage. Over 70 different GenLock models were available for the Amiga, in addition to dozens of other products, such as the highly acclaimed Video Toaster. Each of these devices have their own pros and cons, but the higher-end products like the SuperGen SX and GVP G-Lock can handle S-Video in addition to Composite, which is a big plus when working with high-quality video sources. For our purposes, any Amiga will do. A 500 with one megabyte of RAM and two floppies is a minimum configuration, but a hard drive really helps. I purchased this 3000 specifically for subtitling back in the mid-90s, and I paid one or $200 for it at the time. I forget exactly how much. A used GenLock was another 50. Of course, PCs of the day could do a great job as well, but the specialized video cards required for GenLocking tended to be quite a bit more expensive. This was due in part to the PC's higher video scan rates, as well as the lack of built-in support for external sync sources, both requiring more specialized video circuitry that added cost. Finally, you'll need something to record your output with. Any VCR will do, but a stereo model is preferred. Better would be a Super VHS deck like this one. The SVHS format uses a higher bandwidth tape to record at 420 lines of resolution, compared once again to only 240 lines offered by standard VHS. This makes it a suitable match for our LaserDisc source material. Back when I was actively subbing in the 90s, I used a high-end SVHS editing deck that had all kinds of bells and whistles, but I sold it long ago and keep the JVC consumer model around just to have something for playback. So here's the complete Amiga fan subbing setup ready for action. Let's take a look around back and see how it's all connected up. It's a bit of a rat's nest back here, but first the Amiga's RGB video connects to and powers the external GenLock. The GenLock also connects to the Amiga on joystick port 2, so it can be controlled by software. The RGB video is passed through to the Amiga's regular monitor, or in this case the PVM. For optimal quality, we'll use the S-Video output from the LaserDisc player, which connects to the video input of the GenLock. S-Video from the GenLock is fed into the Super VHS deck for recording. Stereo audio is routed directly from the LDP to the SVHS deck. Finally, the VCR's audio and video output get sent to our playback monitor where we can examine our final product. Alternatively, it could go to the second input on the primary display. Now that we have all of our hardware together, we'll need some software to create and output our titles. The premier package for this task on the Amiga is JacoSub, whose name is derived from its origins with the Japanese Animation Club of Orlando. The software presents itself much like a text editor or word processor, which it very much is. But hidden within these menus are powerful features for not only defining text styles and layouts, but manipulating timecode for lines of dialogue individually or in bulk. So let's load up a script and take a closer look at some of these features. As you can see, everything in this script is plain text. At the top, we have some header and configuration information, and then as we move down, there are pages and pages of timed and formatted text that represent all of the translated dialogue spoken by characters throughout the first two episodes of the show, in this case, Cowboy Bebop, which we originally translated and subtitled back in 1998. It should be pretty clear already that preparing a script for even a single 20-minute episode is a lot of work. The first step, of course, is the translation. For this, you either have to know someone who wants to do it, pay someone for their time, or download an existing script from another group in order to make your own master copy or tweak it to your liking. 
Now, let's take a closer look at the constituent components of a script. This is important stuff, but it can be a bit dry, so feel free to skip to the next chapter if you don't find it interesting. Starting at the top is a block of comments, including the provenance of this particular time script. Many fan subbing groups made their scripts freely available for others to use, so giving credit where it's due is important. Next, a general disclaimer. Distribution of fan subs was a legal gray area to begin with. But once a title became licensed or commercially available domestically, all distribution of the fan subs must cease. Further, these works should never be used for profit, but personal use of the script is always okay. Moving on, there are a few technical notes about playing back the script. I prefer to use the Amiga's super high res graphics mode to generate my titles as I thought the results were better with the fonts I chose to use. On OCS ECS machines, that limits us to only four colors. Three really, since one is dedicated to the background. Palette shifting can be employed to extend the number of available colors, but earlier machines weren't fast enough to do this on the fly, and a workaround is sometimes required. Here, it's indicated that the script is timed to be used with a laser disk source, and that it syncs up to the video at frame zero. We'll talk more about sync points in a moment. Here, we define a time resolution of 1 100th of a second, giving us convenient hour, minute, second, and two decimal places of accuracy for our timing. It's important to be accurate, we want our subtitles to appear on screen exactly when each character speaks their lines. The ramp setting applies a linear time shift, such that by the very end of the script, the timing will be fully offset by the specified value. This is necessary when using a script someone else created on different hardware and the clocks don't match exactly, resulting in playback drifting out of sync either a little too fast or too slow. The shift setting applies a time offset at the very beginning of the script, useful for instance if the sync point of your media differs from the script creators. Here are the definitions for palettes 0 through 3, each containing some combination of colors plus a background that's used for transparency. Since we're limited to only three colors, we can cycle through the palettes as needed, but only one can be used on screen at any given time. Finally, we have our font definitions. If you've watched fan subs back in the day, you may remember a lot of them looking more or less the same. Many groups just use the default font and settings, but others customize their look and feel, as was done here. Now this is where all of the configuration comes together. These are directive definitions, and each consists of a string of codes that define a particular style. Using directive definitions, you can set up a template using your custom fonts, colors, and layouts. There's an initial upfront cost, but you can reuse the template over and over again for each future episode or film. The first line is simply used for normal dialogue and uses the default style, which is configured in the JacoSub user interface. The next style is for raised dialogue used when a second person is speaking at the same time. The codes here read something like this. The text should be vertically above the previous line, and the vertical spacing should be 120% of the font's height. Change the font to 1, which is civilian bold 45 point. Simple, right? There is an easier way. Choose a directive or line of time dialog, then select text directive in the menu. Here, we can set the vertical position, offset, and height, as well as the font definition and attributes such as bold, italic, outline, and shadow. Horizontal controls include margins, justification, and wrapping. Color controls allow you to choose a palette and color definition for the face and background, as well as a shading pattern. When applied, changes here will update the directive for the chosen line in the script. Okay, now we're ready to display some text. Let's see what Directive 6 and 7 look like in action. Cool, so now let's try some other styles. Each line has a start time, an end time, a directive, an optional comment, and the text to display on screen.
Here are two lines of dialogue with overlapping time codes that use directive 0 and 1 respectively. Fancy. Let's look at one more script real quickly. One last feature I want to demonstrate is the ability to include another file at any given point in time. Here, I've included the lyrics to an opening song at 2 minutes 51.46 seconds. If we open up the included file, notice that its timecode starts at zero. So it'll start immediately at the time we placed it in the parent script. This timing can then be reused in every subsequent episode that uses the same opening music. In addition to high quality source material and a good translation, we'll also need accurate timing for our subtitles. That's where choosing a sync point comes in. The sync point is the initial moment in time when your script starts and is in perfect alignment with the source video. All your timing will be based on the sync point, so it's important to choose something that's easy and repeatable. When using VHS as your source, the sync point could be an audio cue, such as the fourth beat of the intro song. It could also be a visual cue, like the title logo first appearing on screen. Whatever it is, you must be able to start the playback of your script at that exact moment each and every time. Choosing a sync point when using a laser disc is trivial since the hardware allows you to queue up a track while paused. The instant you hit play on the device, you start your script playback. Now that we have a sync point, we can define the start and end times for each line of dialogue in our script. The first way to do this is with punch-in timing. This method requires you to hit the spacebar to capture the start time of each line of dialogue as they occur in real time. This method of capturing timing isn't the most efficient, as it requires you to make one or more passes through the entire show linearly and at one-to-one -one speed. What's more, it's relatively inaccurate, and a single error can throw off every subsequent line of dialogue, requiring the timing to be done again. I'm sure you're wondering if there's a better way to time dialogue, and I'm happy to say there is, but there's a catch. As you can see, it involves using a PC, which is fine. By this point in time, we were well into the Pentium era, and PCs were ubiquitous daily drivers. The program we'll be using for fast and accurate timing is called Substation Alpha, or SSA, a popular fan subbing package for PCs. The software has a unique feature not present in JacoSub, the ability to extract timecode from an audio recording. SSA has the ability to import JacoSub scripts natively, so let's start by loading up one of ours from the Amiga. Here, we have all the lines of dialogue, with default start and end times applied. From within SSA, we can either create an audio recording of our source material or load a WAV file we have already prepared. The audio file is created using the sync point we've chosen for this specific script and recorded using the PC sound card. Now, we can see the waveform of the show's dialogue. Using the mouse, it's a simple process of selecting in and out points and matching the dialogue to the translation one line at a time. Once you have the in and out points correct, pressing the grab times button will extract the start and end times from the WAV file and apply it to the current line in the script. Continue timing each subsequent line until the entire episode or movie is complete.
Finally, the timed script can be saved and re-imported into JCOSub to continue the process. So that's about it for dialog, but what about on-screen text? No problem, we can handle those easily. First, enter the translated text into your script with a suitable font. Then, with the source material on screen, use Jacosub's mouse move to position it where you want it to appear. Now, we just need to get the correct start and end times for the text. That involves recording a copy of the source material and starting at the sync point, overlaying time code from the Amiga onto the tape. Afterwards, we'll play back the recording we made with the VCR and step forward or backward frame by frame to pick out the exact time code when the text should appear and disappear. It helps to have a forehead VCR with a proper jog shuttle for this part, but any unit will work. Enter the start and end times into your script, and when you play it back, you'll have a perfectly timed overlay for any text that appears on screen. It should be pretty clear by now that this is a time-consuming process, but it's all part of creating a high-quality finished product. I always like to challenge myself to produce something as good, if not better, than what was commercially available at the time. Of course, it's possible to go even further, as Jacosub can execute timed AREC scripts, and the GVP G-Lock can be remotely controlled over the joystick port by such a script to fade text in and out, for example. With our script complete, we can now run off our first full copy of an episode or movie. Feature-length films can occupy multiple sides of multiple laser discs, so there will be separate scripts for each. Each 30-minute segment will then be stitched together in sequence on tape, along with any splash screens, translation notes, or bonus materials you may put on the tape. Having a high-end video recorder with a flying erase head helps to make seamless, frame-accurate transitions. With your first copy complete, you can now review it for timing accuracy, typos, text positioning, and other errors. Correct any mistakes and iterate through the process again and again until it's perfect. With old school linear video production, there really aren't that many shortcuts. Once you're happy that your script is well and truly done, you can finally run off a Super VHS master copy. These are first generation products made directly from the original source material and were highly prized back in the day. Master copies were usually only traded between members of other fan subbing groups, sent to clubs or conventions, or mailed to distributors so they could get your show out to the public. Once a master tape with three or four 30 minute episodes or a feature film is complete, it's time for distribution. Many fan subgroups use third-party distributors to handle this part of the process. Distributors are separate groups that didn't translate or subtitle themselves, but instead had many VCRs set up, running them constantly to churn out copy after copy. Honest groups would only charge a nominal fee for the price of the VHS tape and shipping. Another option many distributors offered was to send your own tape to them in a self-addressed stamped envelope, in which case no money would change hands. A handful of bootleggers did exist who would overcharge in an attempt to make profit from the hard work of other subbers. Hence, the ubiquitous phrase, free fan sub, not for sale or rent. So, fan subbing with the Amiga, a time consuming, expensive hobby that wasn't strictly legal. Given that, why would anyone want to do it? Well, like making videos for YouTube, the point was always to create, share, build and participate in a community, and ultimately grow awareness of a niche you enjoyed. 
Judging by how popular anime became in the Western world in the years that followed, it would seem that the mission that Fansubber set out to accomplish all the way back in the 80s and 90s was a huge success. I hope you enjoyed this small peek into the world of fansubbing. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time on Retro Bits. <laughs>